I know what my father was, what he did. I know the Mad King earned his name. Burn them all! Kill every Targaryen I get my hands on. Everyone who isn't us is an enemy. Sir Illyn, bring me his head! What's up ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another A Song of Ice and Fire video. Today I want to read one of the most iconic chapters from this amazing story. I know a lot of my subscribers have never read the books, so I wanted to read some of the best chapters to you, that way you could see how different they were from the show. I have also wanted to read some of the best parts from the books that the show did not add, so you could get a good feel for how great the source material actually is. If you have read the books, then you probably won't be interested in this, but I wanted to see if people would like these kind of videos. If you do like this, then perhaps I could read a different chapter once a week or even once a month. I figured the best way to start off this series would be to read one of the greatest chapters first, which is The Red Wedding. Just to show you how powerful this chapter actually is, let me read a few words from George R.R. Martin himself. George said, I knew the Red Wedding was coming, and I've been planning it all along. But when I came to that chapter, which occurs two-thirds of the way through A Storm of Swords, I found I couldn't write that chapter. I skipped over that chapter and wrote the hundreds of pages that followed. The entire book was done, except for the scene with the Red Wedding, and even all the aftermath of the Red Wedding. It was just so hard to write that scene, because I'd been inhabiting Catelyn for so long, and of course I have a lot of affection for Rob too, although he was never a viewpoint character. And even for some of the minor characters. Yeah, they're minor characters, but you develop a relationship to them too. And I knew they were all going to die. It was some of the hardest writing I've ever done. But it's also one of the most powerful scenes I've ever done. So with that being said, let's begin. The Red Wedding takes place during one of Catelyn's POV chapters in the third book, a Storm of Swords. The drums were pounding, 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 and her head with them. Pipes wailed and flutes trilled from the musician's gallery at the foot of the hall. Fiddles screeched, horns blew, the skin skirled a lively tune, but the drumming drove them all. The sounds echoed off the rafters while the guests ate, drank, and shouted at one another below. Walter Frey must be deaf as a stone to call this music. Catelyn sipped a cup of wine and watched Jingle Bell prance to the sounds of Alisanne. At least she thought it was meant to be Alisanne. With these players, it might as easily have been the bear in the maiden fair. Outside, the rain still fell, but within the twins, the air was thick and hot. A fire roared in the hearth, and rows of torches burned smokily from iron sconces on the walls. Yet most of the heat came off the bodies of the wedding guests, jammed in so thick along the benches that every man who tried to lift his cup poked his neighbor in the ribs. Even on the dais, they were closer than Catelyn would have liked. She had been placed between Sir Ryman Frey and Roose Bolton, and had gotten a good noseful of both. Sir Ryman drank as if Westeros was about to run short of wine, and sweated it all out under his arms. He had bathed in lemon water, she judged, but no lemon could mask so much sour sweat. Roos Bolton had a sweeter smell to him, yet no more pleasant. He sipped Hippocras in preference to wine or mead, and ate but little. Catelyn could not fault him for his lack of appetite. The wedding feast began with a thin leek soup, followed by a salad of green beans, onions, and beets, river pike poached in almond milk, mounds of mashed turnips that were cold before they reached the table jellied calves brains, and a leech of stringy beef. It was poor fare to set before a king, and the calves brains turned Catelyn's stomach. Yet Rob ate it uncomplaining, and her brother was too caught up with his bride to pay much attention. You would never guess Edmure complained of Roslyn all the way from River Run to the twins. Husband and wife ate from a single plate, drank from a single cup, and exchanged chaste kisses between sips. Most of the dishes Edmure waved away. She could not blame him for that. She remembered little of the food served at her own wedding feast. Did I even taste it? Or spend the whole time gazing at Ned's face, wondering who he was? Poor Rosalind's smile had a fixed quality to it, as if someone had sewn it onto her face. Well, she is a maid wedded, but the bedding's yet to come. No doubt she's as terrified as I was. Rob was seated between Alex Frey and Fair Walda, two of the more nubile Frey maidens. 
At the wedding feast, I hope you will not refuse to dance with my daughters, Walter Frey had said. It would please an old man's heart. His heart should be well pleased, then. Rob had done his duty like a king. He had danced with each of the girls, with Edmure's bride and the eighth lady Frey, with the widow Amy and Roose Bolton's wife, Fat Walda, with the pimply twins, Sarah and Sara, even with Cherie, Lord Walder's youngest, who must have been all of six. Catelyn wondered whether the Lord of the Crossing would be satisfied, or if he would find cause for complaint and all the other daughters and granddaughters who had not had a turn with the king. Your sisters dance very well, she said to Sir Ryman Frey, trying to be pleasant. They're aunts and cousins. Sir Ryman drank a swallow of wine, the sweat trickling down his cheek into his beard. A sour man, and in his cups, Catelyn thought. The late Lord Frey might be niggardly when it came to feeding his guests, but he did not stint on the drink. The ale, wine, and mead were flowing as fast as the river outside. The Great John was already roaring drunk. Lord Walder's son, Merritt, was matching him cup for cup, but Sir Whalen Frey had passed out trying to keep up with the two of them. Catelyn would sooner Lord Umber had seen fit to stay sober, but telling the Great John not to drink was like telling him not to breathe for a few hours. Small John Umber and Robin Flint sat near Rob to the other side of Fairwalda and Alex respectively. Neither of them was drinking along with Patrick Malister and Daisy Mormont. They were her son's guards this evening. A wedding feast was not a battle, but there were always dangers when men were in their cups, and a king should never be unguarded. Catelyn was glad of that, and even more glad of the sword belts hanging on pegs along the walls. No man needs a longsword to deal with jelly calves brains. Everyone thought my lord would choose fair Walda, Lady Walda Bolton told Sir Wendell, shouting to be heard above the music. Fat Walda was a round pink butterball of a girl with watery blue eyes, limp yellow hair, and a huge bosom, yet her voice was a fluttering squeak. It was hard to picture her in the Dreadfort in her pink lace and cape of vair. My lord grandfather offered Roos his bride's weight in silver as a dowry, though, so my lord of Bolton picked me. The girl's chins jiggled when she laughed. I weigh six stone more than Fair Walda, but that was the first time I was glad of it. I'm Lady Bolton now, and my cousin's still a maid, and she'll be 19 soon, poor thing. The Lord of the Dreadford paid the chatter no mind, Catelyn saw. Sometimes he tasted a bite of this, a spoon of that. Tearing bread from the loaf was short, strong fingers, but the meal could not distract him. Bolton had made a toast to Lord Walder's grandsons when the wedding feast began, pointedly mentioning that Walder and Walder were in the care of his bastard son. From the way the old man had squinted at him, his mouth sucking at the air, Catelyn knew he had heard the unspoken threat. Was there ever a wedding less joyful, she wondered, until she remembered her poor Sansa and her marriage to the imp. Mother take mercy on her, she has a gentle soul. The heat and smoke and noise were making her sick. The musicians in the gallery might be numerous and loud, but they were not especially gifted. Catelyn took another swallow of wine and allowed a page to refill her cup. A few more hours and the worst will be over. By this hour tomorrow, Rob would be off to another battle, this time with the Iron Men at Moat Kaelin. Strange how that prospect seemed almost a relief. He will win his battle. He wins all his battles and the Ironborn are without a king. Besides, Ned taught him well. The drums were pounding. Jingle Bell hopped past her once again, but the music was so loud she could scarcely hear his bells. Above the den came a sudden snarling as two dogs fell upon each other over a scrap of meat. They rolled across the floor, snapping and biting, as a howl of mirth went up. Someone doused them with a flagon of ale and they broke apart. One limped toward the dais, Lord Walder's toothless mouth opened in a bark of laughter as the dripping wet dog shook ale and hair all over three of his grandsons. The sight of the dogs made Catelyn wish once more for Grey Wind, but Rob's dire wolf was nowhere to be seen. Lord Walder had refused to allow him in the hall. Your wild beast has a taste for human flesh, I hear, the old man had said. Rips out throats, yes, I'll have no such creature at my Rosalind's feast amongst women and little ones, all my sweet innocence. Grey Wen is no danger to them, my lord, Rob protested, not so long as I am there. 
You were there at my gates, were you not? When the wolf attacked the grandson I sent to greet you. I heard all about that. Don't think I didn't. No harm was done. No harm, the king says. No harm? Peter fell from his horse. Fell. I lost a wife the same way. Falling. His mouth worked in and out. Or was she just some strumpet? Bastard Walter's mother. Yes, now I recall. She fell off her horse and cracked her head. What would your grace do if Peter had broken his neck, huh? Give me another apology in place of my grandson? No, no, no. Might be your king? I won't say you're not. The king in the north, huh? But under my roof? My rule. Have your wolf or have your wedding, sir? You'll not have both. Catelyn could tell that her son was furious, but he yielded with as much courtesy as he could summon. If it pleases Lord Walter to serve me stewed crow smothered in maggots, he told her, I'll eat it and ask for a second bowl. And so he had. The great John had drunk another of Lord Walter's brood under the table. Peter Pimple this time. The lad has a third his capacity. What did he expect? Lord Umber wiped his mouth, stood, and began to sing. A bear there was, a bear, a bear, all black and brown and covered with hair. His voice was not all bad, though somewhat thick from drink. Unfortunately, the fiddlers and drummers and flutists up above were playing Flowers of Spring, which suited the words of the bear and the maiden fair as well as snails might suit a bowl of porridge. Even poor Jingle Bell covered his ears at the cacophony. Roose Bolton murmured some words too soft to hear and went off in search of a privy. The cramped hall was in a constant uproar of guests and servants coming and going. A second feast for knights and lords of somewhat lesser rank was roaring along in the other castle she knew. Lord Walter had exiled his baseborn children and their offspring to that side of the river, so that Rob's Northmen had taken to referring to it as the Bastard Feast. Some guests were having no doubt stealing off to see if the bastards were having a better time than they were. Some might even be venturing as far as the camps. The phrase had provided wagons of wine, ale, and mead so the common soldiers could drink to the wedding of River Run and the twins. Rob sat down in Bolton's vacant place. A few more hours and this farce is done, mother, he said in a low voice, as the great John sang of the maid with honey in her hair. Black Walter's been mild as a lamb for once, and Uncle Edmure seems well content in his bride. He leaned across her. Sir Ryman Frey blinked and said, Sir, yes. I'd hoped to ask Oliver to squire for me when we head north, said Rob, but I do not see him here. Would he be at the other feast? Oliver? Sir Ryman shook his head. No, not Oliver. Gone. Gone from the castles. Duty. I see. Rob's tone suggested otherwise. When Sir Ryman offered nothing more, the king got to his feet again. Would you care for a dance, mother? Thank you, but no. A dance was the last thing she needed, the way her head was throbbing. No doubt one of Lord Walder's daughters would be pleased to partner you. Oh, no doubt. His smile was resigned. The musicians were playing Iron Lances by then, while the great John sang The Lusty Lad. Someone should acquaint them with each other, it might improve the harmony. Catelyn turned back to Sir Ryman. I had heard that one of your cousins was a singer. Alexander, Simon's son. Alex is his sister. He raised a cup toward where she danced with Robin Flint. Will Alexander be playing for us tonight? Sir Ryman squinted at her. Not him, he's away. He wiped sweat from his brow and lurched to his feet. Pardons, my lady. Catelyn watched him stagger toward the door. Edmure was kissing Rosalind and squeezing her hand. Elsewhere in the hall, Sir Mark Piper and Sir Danwell Frey played a drinking game. Lame Lothar said something amusing to Sir Hostine. One of the younger Freys juggled three daggers for a group of giggly girls. And Jingle Bell sat on the floor sucking wine off his fingers. The servers were bringing out huge silver plates piled high with cuts of juicy pink lamb. The most appetizing dish they'd seen all evening. And Rob was leading Daisy Mormont in a dance. When she wore a dress, Lady Mage's eldest daughter was quite pretty, tall and willowy with a shy smile that made her long face light up. It was pleasant to see that she could be as graceful on the dance floor as in the training yard. Catelyn wondered if Lady Mage had reached the neck as yet. She had taken her other daughters with her, but as one of Rob's battle companions, Daisy had chosen to remain by his side. He has Ned's gift for inspiring loyalty. Oliver Frey had been downvoted to her son as well. Hadn't Rob said that Oliver wanted to remain with him, even after he'd married Jane? 
Seated betwixt his black oak towers, the Lord of the Crossing clapped his spotted hands together. The noise they made was so faint that even those on the dais scarce heard it. But Sir Aenys and Sir Hostine saw and began to pound their cups on the table. Lame Lothar joined them, then Mark Piper and Sir Danwell and Sir Raymond. Half the guests were soon pounding. Finally, even the mob of musicians in the gallery took note. The piping, drumming, and fiddling trailed off into quiet. Your grace, Lord Walter called out to Rob. The Septon has prayed his prayers. Some words have been said, and Lord Edmure's wrapped my sweetling in a fish cloak. But they are not yet man and wife. A sword needs a sheath, huh? And a wedding needs a bedding. What does my sire say? Is it meet that we should bed them? A score or more of Walter Frey's sons and grandsons began to bang their cups again, shouting, To bed, to bed, to bed with them. Rosalind had gone white. Catelyn wondered whether it was the prospect of losing her maidenhead that frightened the girl or the bedding itself. With so many siblings, she was not like to be a stranger to the custom, but it was different when you were the one being bedded. On Catelyn's own wedding night, Jory Castle had torn her gown in haste to get her out of it and drunken Desmond Grell kept apologizing for every body joke, only to make another. When Lord Dustin had beheld her naked, he told Ned that her breasts were enough to make him wish he'd never been weaned. Poor man, she thought. He had ridden south with Ned, never to return. Catelyn wondered how many of the men here tonight would be dead before the year was done. Too many, I fear. Rob raised a hand. If you think the time is me, Lord Walter, by all means, let us bed them. A roar of approval greeted his pronouncement. Up in the gallery, the musicians took up their pipes and horns and fiddles again and began to play. The queen took off her sandal. The king took off his crown. Jingle Bell hopped from foot to foot, his own crown ringing. I hear tally men have trout between their legs instead of cocks, Alex Frey called out boldly. To which Sir Mark Piper threw back. I hear that Frey women have two gates in place of one. And Alex said, A. Hey, but both are closed and barred to little things like you. A gust of laughter followed, until Patrick Malister climbed up onto a table to propose a toast to Edmure's one-eyed fish. And a mighty pike it is, he proclaimed. Nay, I'll wager it's a minnow. Fat Walter Bolton shouted out from Catelyn's side. Then the general cry of bed them, bed them, went up again. The guests swarmed the dais, the drunken in the forefront as ever. The men and boys surrounded Roslyn and lifted her into the air while the maids and mothers in the hall pulled Edmure to his feet and began tugging at his clothing. He was laughing and shouting, body jokes back at them, though the music was too loud for Catelyn to hear. She heard the great John, though, give this little bride to me. He bellowed as he shoved through the other men and threw Roslyn over one shoulder. Look at this little thing. No meat on her at all. Catelyn felt sorry for the girl. Most brides tried to return the banter, or at least pretended to enjoy it. But Roslyn was stiff with terror, clutching the great John as if she feared he might drop her. She's crying too, Catelyn realized as she watched Sir Mark Piper pull off one of the bride's shoes. I hope Edmure is gentle with the poor child. Jolly, body music still poured down from the gallery. The queen was taking off her kirtle now, and the king his tunic. She knew she should join the throng of women round her brother, but she would only ruin their fun. The last thing she felt just now was body. Edmure would forgive her absence, she did not doubt. Much jollier to be stripped and bedded by a score of lusty, laughing phrase than by a sour, stricken sister. Unless you're Jamie Lannister, of course. As man and maid were carried from the hall, a trail of clothing behind them. Catelyn saw that Rob had also remained. Walter Frey was prickly enough to see some insult to his daughter in that. He should join in Rosalind's betting, but is it my place to tell him so? She tensed, until she saw that others had stayed as well. Peter Pimple and Sir Whalen Frey slept on, their heads on the table. Merritt Frey poured himself another cup of wine, while Jingle Bell wandered about stealing bites off the plates of those who'd left. Sir Wendell Manderley was lustily attacking a leg of lamb, and of course Lord Walter was far too feeble to leave his seat without help. He will expect Rob to go, though. She could almost hear the old man asking why his grace did not want to see his daughter naked. The drums were pounding again, pounding and pounding and pounding. Daisy Mormont, who seemed to be the only woman left in the hall besides Catelyn, stepped up behind Edwin Frey and touched him lightly on the arm as she said something in his ear. Edwin wrenched himself away from her with unseemly violence. No, he said, too loudly. 
I'm done with dancing for the nonce. Daisy paled and turned away. Catelyn got slowly to her feet. What just happened there? Doubt gripped her heart, where an instant before had been only wariness. It is nothing, she tried to tell herself. You are seeing grumpkins in the woodpile. You have become an old silly woman sick with grief and fear. But something must have shown on her face. Even Sir Wendell Manderley took note. Is something amiss? He asked, the leg of lamb in his hands. She did not answer him. Instead, she went after Edwin Frey. The players in the gallery had finally gotten both king and queen down to their name day suits. With scarcely a moment's respite, they began to play a very different sort of song. No one sang the words, but Catelyn knew the reins of Castamir when she heard it. Edwin was hurrying toward a door. She hurried faster, driven by the music. Six quick strides and she caught him. And who are you? The proud lord said, that I must bow so low. She grabbed Edwin by the arm to turn him and went cold all over when she felt the iron rings beneath his silken sleeve. Catelyn slapped him so hard she broke his lip. Oliver, she thought, and Perwin, Alessander, all absent, and Rosalind wept. Edwin Frey shoved her aside. The music drowned all other sound, echoing off the walls as if the stones themselves were playing. Rob gave Edwin an angry look and moved to block his way, and staggered suddenly as a quarrel sprouted from his side, just beneath the shoulder. If he screamed then, the sound was swallowed by the pipes and horns and fiddles. Catelyn saw a second bolt pierce his leg, saw him fall. Up in the gallery, half the musicians had crossbows in their hands instead of drums or lutes. She ran toward her son until something punched in the small of the back and the hard stone floor came up to slap her. Rob, she screamed. She saw Small John Umber wrestle a table off its trestles. Crossbow bolts thudded into the wood, one, two, three, as he flung it down on top of his king. Robin Flint was ringed by frays, their daggers rising and falling. Sir Wendell Manderley rose ponderously to his feet, holding his leg of lamb. A quarrel went into his open mouth and came out the back of his neck. Sir Wendell crashed forward, knocking the table off its trestles and sending cups, flagons, trenchers, platters, turnips, beets, and wine bouncing, spilling, and sliding across the floor. Catelyn's back was on fire. I have to reach him. The small John bludgeoned Sir Raymond Frey across the face with a leg of mutton. But when he reached for his sword belt, a crossbow bolt drove him to his knees. In a coat of gold or a coat of red, a lion still has claws. She saw Lucas Blackwood cut down by Sir Hostine Frey. One of the Vances was hamstrung by Blackwater as he was wrestling with Sir Harris Hay. And mine are long and sharp, my lord, as long and sharp as yours. The crossbows took Donald Locke, Owen Nori, and a half a dozen more. Young Sir Benfrey had seized Daisy Mormont by the arm, but Catelyn saw her grab up a flagon of wine with her other hand and smash it full in her face and run for the door. It flew open before she reached it. Sir Ryman Frey pushed into the hall, clad in steel from helm to heel. A dozen Frey men-at-arms packed the door behind them. They were armed with heavy long axes. Mercy, Catelyn cried, but horns and drums and the clash of steel smothered her plea. Sir Ryman buried the head of the axe in Daisy's stomach. By then, men were pouring in the other doors as well. Mailed men in shaggy fur cloaks with steel in their hands. Northmen, she took them for rescue for half a heartbeat, till one of them struck the small John's head off with two huge blows of his axe. Hope blew out like a candle in a storm. In the midst of slaughter, the Lord of the Crossing sat on his carved oaken throne, watching greedily. There was a dagger on the floor a few feet away. Perhaps it had skittered there when the small John knocked the table off its trestles, or perhaps it had fallen from the hand of some dying man. Catelyn crawled toward it. Her limbs were leaden, and the taste of blood was in her mouth. I will kill Walter Frey, she told herself. Jingle Bell was closer to the knife, hiding under a table, but he only cringed away as she snatched up the blade. I will kill the old man. I can do that much at least. Then the tabletop that Small John had flung over Rob shifted, and her son struggled to his knees. He had an arrow in his side, a second in his leg, a third through his chest. Lord Walter raised a hand, and the music stopped, all but one drum. Catelyn heard the crash of distant battle, and closer the wind howling of a wolf. Grey wind, she remembered, too late. Huh? Lord Walter cackled at Rob. The king in the north arises. Seems we killed some of your men, your grace. 
Oh, but I'll make you an apology. That will mend them all again, huh? Catelyn grabbed a handful of Jingle Bell Frey's long gray hair and dragged him out of his hiding place. Lord Walter, she shouted. Lord Walter. The drum beat slow and sonorous. Doom, boom, doom. Enough, said Catelyn. Enough, I say. You have repaid betrayal with betrayal. Let it end. When she pressed her dagger to Jingle Bell's throat, the memory of Bran's sick room came back to her, with the feel of steel at her own throat. The drum went boom, doom, boom, doom, boom, doom. Please, she said, he is my son, my first son, and my last. Let him go. Let him go, and I swear we will forget this. Forget all you've done here. I swear it by the old gods and the new. We, we will take no vengeance. Lord Walter peered at her in mistrust. Only a fool would believe such blather. Do you take me for a fool, my lady? I take you for a father. Keep me for a hostage. Edmure as well if you haven't killed him, but let Rob go. No. Rob's voice was whisper faint. Mother, no. Yes, Rob. Get up. Get up and walk out. Please. Please. Save yourself. If not for me, for Jane. Jane? Rob grabbed the edge of the table and forced himself to stand. Mother, he said. Grey Wind. Go to him. Now. Rob, walk out of here. Lord Walter snorted. And why would I let him do that? She pressed the blade deeper into Jingle Bell's throat. The lackwit rolled his eyes at her in mute appeal. A foul stench assailed her nose, but she paid it no more mind than she did the sullen, ceaseless pounding of that drum. Boom, doom, boom, doom, boom, doom. Sir Ryman and Black Walter were circling round her back, but Catelyn did not care. They could do as they wished with her, imprison her, rape her, kill her, it made no matter. She had lived too long, and Ned was waiting. It was Rob she feared for. On my honor as a Tully, she told Lord Walter, on my honor as a Stark, I will trade your boy's life for Rob's. A son for a son. Her hand shook so badly she was ringing Jingle Bell's head. Boom, the drum sounded. Boom, doom, boom, doom. The old man's lips went in and out. The knife trembled in Catelyn's hand, slippery with sweat. A son for a son, huh? He repeated. But that's a grandson, and he never was much use. A man in dark armor and a pale pink cloak spotted with blood stepped up the rob. Jamie Lannister sends his regards. He thrust his longsword through her son's heart and twisted. Rob had broken his word, but Catelyn kept hers. She tugged hard on Aegon's hair and sawed at his neck until the blade grated on bone. Blood ran hot over her fingers. His little bells were ringing, 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 and the drum went boom, doom, boom. Finally, someone took the knife away from her. The tears burned like vinegar as they ran down her cheeks. Ten fierce ravens were raking her face with sharp talons and tearing off strips of flesh, leaving deep furrows that ran red with blood. She could taste it on her lips. It hurts so much, she thought. Our children, Ned. All our sweet babes. Rickon, Bran, Arya, Sansa, Rob. Rob. Please, Ned. Please make it stop. Make it stop hurting. The white tears and the red ones ran together until her face was torn and tattered. The face that Ned had loved. Catelyn Stark raised her hands and watched the blood run down her long fingers, over her wrists, beneath the sleeves of her gown. Slow red worms crawled along her arms and under her clothes. It tickles that made her laugh until she screamed. Mad, someone said. She's lost her wits. And someone else said, make an end. And a hand grabbed her scalp just as she'd done with Jingle Bell. And she thought, no, don't. Don't cut my hair. Ned loves my hair. Then the steel was at her throat. And its bite was red and cold.